So we begin a new series this today through uh, September 7th, and it's called Thrive. For me, it is about moving beyond survival into thrival. <laughs> if that's a word. If it's not, it is now. So, um, right? About really getting unstuck. Now, I don't know about you. Maybe your life works perfectly in every area all the time. <laughs> Good on you, and you should probably be up here speaking. For the rest of us, however, it seems like some of it works in areas where we get stuck, areas where we're challenged, areas where it's just not unfolding the way we'd like. And that's okay. We're only here to grow and to change and to prosper and all that. We looked at that as a spiritual community. It was like, it is time for us to thrive as a community, to really take that next step that Spirit is calling us to become. And so we looked at this idea around Thrive, and it really stands for I am thankful, happy, resilient, inspired, vivacious, and enthusiastic. <laughs> Just want to make sure I said the right word there. <laughs> How does that sound? You good with that? Is that okay? Okay, good. So the appropriate place to start is always in gratitude. You know, we come back to this, I think, over and over and over, but it perhaps is the most important principle for us to learn. Because it is true that if we are in a state of gratitude, we can't be in a state of something else. And so sometimes it's something else is depression or sadness or whatever. So this practice, this spiritual practice of recognizing all that we have to be grateful for, all of the opportunities that are in front of us, all of the good that's showing up in our life. And so, you know, the really, there's a really simple practice called the 10 things I'm grateful for. It turns out you have 10 fingers. Most of us do. Some don't. But, you know, most of us do. If not, you can figure this out, you know. Um, and just counting every night, 10 things you're grateful for. Your health, your family, your shelter, all of the blessings in our life. Because I'm, I'm, I'm profoundly aware of late that in the culture in which we find ourselves, what, the most prosperous country in the history of humanity the most prosperous, that we take for granted more than most people have in the rest of the world. And so often, I'm fascinated when I do this or when I hear others talk about what's missing in their life. And I, I sense that in this culture in which we live, you know, there's always more to be had. It doesn't matter how wealthy you are, there's always more you could get. And so if we're not careful, we can move into a mentality that says my life is not enough, that my life really won't work until I have my next hundred million dollars, or, or, you know, or till I have the bigger home, the bigger car, the bigger whatever. And my life's not a complete until I'm in that right relationship. Or for some of you, my life's not complete till I'm out of this relationship. You know, wherever you are in that spectrum, I get it, right? That there's a sense sometimes that my life is not enough. And I need more, and I need more, and I need more. And the misconception around that is that more changes anything. Right? You know what I'm talking about, right? So often we think that if we can just get to this place, then we'll be happy. But the basic fundamental idea that we're working from is nothing outside of you ultimately will make you happy. It may reflect your happiness. That right relationship can reflect the joy you feel as a whole human being. That right work will reflect the joy you feel as an inspired, gifted person giving your gift to the world. The joy that you feel ultimately comes from within ourselves, knowing who we are and living from that state. So the first step we always want to take is to be grateful for what we have, for grateful for what is, to be grateful for the many blessings that are in our lives. I know that I have been guilty from time to time of thinking that if only this would happen, 
whatever this is, you can fill in your own blank here. Well, if only this would happen, then my life would really work, then I'd be really happy, then I'd really all be pulled together, right? Yeah, I don't know, if you probably don't do that, but I'm just having a little <laughs> confessional moment, so thank you for letting me share that with you. Um, but you know, I find that there's a state, we can either be in a state of gratitude or in a state of greed. And so greed, for those of you who come from traditions that know what the seven deadly sins are, it's one of them. I'm not sure where it falls in the spectrum. I'll have to look that up, right? That one of the sins is greed. Now, I'm not going all Southern Baptist on you, so relax. It's okay. <laughs> but I could. I could do it in a minute, I tell you. So let me just explain how we're using the word sin today. <laughs> You are not a sinner unless you are committing error. Because the word itself means error. It means it's actually an archery term meaning missing the mark. And so in that sense, we all miss the mark at one time or another, right? None of us get right perfectly. So when, I, when we look at that, if you think about it, if we're in that state of greed that I need more, I'm lusting more, I'm craving more, whether it's food or money or power or whatever it is, we're not recognizing the all-sufficiency of spirit. So it is an error. It is a way of being. And ultimately, it is not a thing that brings us joy or fulfillment. You see, when we are not happy with what is, and we need more, not want more, but need more, that, that, that state of mind that is grasping and clutching and seeking something, that says, if I have a lot of money, then I'll be powerful. Right? If I have a lot of stuff, then my life will really be working. Nothing wrong with having stuff. I'm a big fan of stuff. I have a lot of stuff. Sometimes I look around and go, what are you doing with all this stuff? You know? <laughs> I got closets full of stuff. I mean, you know, we all do. It's not like any of us are insufficient. But it is the relationship that we hold with our stuff that's important. And so for many of us to understand that 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 grasping, clutching sense of being that says, I've got to have more, is actually a deterrent to us having the life that we want. It starts with being in gratitude for the blessings that are right here, right now. <clears throat> so when we move out of that intense sense of, so greed is this intense or selfish desire for something, especially wealth, power, or food. Gratitude is the quality of being thankful, the readiness to show appreciation for and to return kindnesses. You see, when I'm in that state of gratitude, it opens up another aspect for me. And for me, it's interesting that the word grace and the word gratitude come from the same root word, gratis in Latin. You see, when we are in a state of gratitude, when we recognize the many blessings in our lives, it naturally opens a sense of grace. And grace, again, is that sense and that knowing of the self-givingness of spirit. If we were to step back for a moment from our little ego minds that think that we run our lives, you know that part of your mind, um, some of you have such expanded egos as I used to, no longer, of course, because I'm evolved, that think that, <laughs> that I run my life, that I control my life, right? But when we can step back from that, what we realize is none of it's true. There's one life, one power, one infinite being that expresses itself through creation. You did not create your life. Your life was given to you. That is the grace of the divine. And so when we get into our me, mine, and my stuff, we're really saying something that is fundamentally not true, which is that it's all on loan, except the spiritual essence of who we are. You get a body, you got to give the body back. <laughs> you don't get to keep it. <laughs> this should not be breaking news to anybody, but we all act as if it's true. <laughs> right? 
You get to use some stuff while you're here, but you get to give the stuff back because you're going to leave at some point in time. You see, we get into a mentality, me and mine and what I want, and right? And we recognize that ain't even true. Spirit is all there is. There's a life unfolding, and so at best we get to use some stuff for a while. So when we move into that right relationship, we recognize there's a sense of grace. There's a sense of openness. There's a sense of willingness to allow the divine to reveal itself through us. That there's no need to clutch. There's no need to grasp. There's no need to try and control. There's simply a shift in consciousness of recognition of the infinite presence that is seeking its revelation through us. And we give thanks for that. It is not an accident, I don't believe, that when you look at the words of Jesus, often when he would go into prayer, he would begin with thanksgiving. He would say, infinite power, I know that you hear me always. I give thanks, right? That's a wonderful state of mind to unblock the flow of our greater good. So we can either be in a state of greed or we can be in a state of gratitude. When we're in a state of gratitude, it opens a state of grace, of allowing, of willingness, of just that sense of peace and purpose that comes forward through us. And when we do that, we begin to realize that where we are is enough. That what I have right now, right here, is enough. If you look at this affirmation that we were given today, brilliant, I might add, <laughs> Who writes these things? <laughs> but it says to us, today I allow my life to thrive. I am grateful for the many blessings in my life. It starts with gratitude. I am conscious of the miracles that surround me. Are we conscious of the miracles that are surrounding us? If we're not, let's get more conscious. It is a miracle when you think about it. It is a miracle that all of the things that are happening in our body right now are happening. It is a miracle when you think about it that I can say I need to pick up this glass of water and a neurological response happens that brings water to me. It's a miracle. Life is nothing but a miracle. But we pout and we whine, and we complain, right? It's a miracle. So we want to become conscious of the miracles. And then we want to be open and receptive to my greater good. You see, it is not that you can either be happy, you can be grateful or you can want more. You can be grateful and still open to a greater possibility that seeks its emergence through us. But we're not waiting for the greater good to happen to be in the state of gratitude. We're not waiting for things to change so that we can. See, this is the fundamental error most of us make is we think that our happiness... Our good is dependent upon a condition outside of ourselves. Right? Am I? I'm not... You're with me on this, right? Okay, just checking. I'd like to check in with you from time to time. So, when we're in this state of, of gratitude, we recognize the enoughness of this moment. We recognize the enoughness of ourself. You see, there's no need to hate where you are in order to move forward. About 14 things are happening right now in my mind, in case you're wondering. So I'm trying to just choose one or two, right? Uh, <laughs> when we recognize our enoughness, we identify with our spiritual essence. One of the things that we sometimes feel is if I were okay, if I were better, if I were worthy, if I were lovable, then my greater good can come. But the truth is, the essence of who we are, the spiritual essence and being of who we are, is whole, it is perfect, it is given freely from the grace of the divine. And anything that you made up about that is just not true. Anything you made up about it's not enoughness 
It ain't so. Now you can go about your life believing it's true and you will create circumstances and situations in your life that may reinforce a limiting belief, but it don't make it true. I can say that gravity doesn't exist and walk right off this stage. <laughs> gravity still exists. Right? So, doesn't make it true. Believe what you want. For me, it's the recognition that I am enough. And so often what I find is those graspings, those cravings, those longings, those, that greediness is coming from a sense of I'm not enough just the way I am. Just who I am. And that if I can create it, see, this is what the ego does. It says, if I can get the resume pulled together and if I can accumulate a bunch of stuff and I can put together this life, then you will never know what a wretched mess I feel like I am. It's the way the ego works, right? Spirit says, I am that I am. Even those evolved souls who say, he that has seen me has seen the Father is talking about a state of being that is not ego, egoic. It is about spiritually based truth. We see the divine in each other. And so when we are starting to look at this, how do we show up more consciously in the world? We want to realize that who we are is manifesting into the world. I know right now I look... I'm really limiting my television usage right now because otherwise I just get too depressed and want to jump off a bridge. You know? I see the wars and I see all this stuff and I'm thinking, Ugh. Now, I also know that that's the news's job. And they're getting so good at it. <laughs> that they present the world in such a way... You know, I always love how they do this. So right before they go to break... Are you going to die tomorrow from this dreaded disease? Stay tuned. I didn't even know there was a dreaded disease, and I hope I'm not going to die tomorrow. I've got to stay tuned. But I'll watch these commercials that will make my life better so that when I find out what I'm going to die from, I'll at least know what product to go buy. Right? It's kind of a crazy mentality if you think about it. So I like to know what's going on in the world, but I can't allow myself to be too deeply engaged. And, but I look at that consciousness of war and I would love to just say, wow, those people should stop that. <laughs> and then I realize I participate in every consciousness that's happening in, on our planet. War is simply wanting to be right at someone else's expense. Right? I am right. I can do what I need to do. I can kill you in the name of God is even better so that... I can be right and you can be wrong. Do you do that? No. I'm not taking confession today, but if I were, <laughs> right? We do that. We have this need for, I don't know why we have this need, but we have this need that I'm going to be right. And that's okay if we're willing to allow the other person to be right as well. You see, there's a place where everybody gets to be right. I was listening on the radio this wonderful little snip it in, you know, when you catch the radio, you usually catch it in the car so I don't catch the full context. But this, they were talking about this idea, and it came from a, a, a lawyer who had, was a divorce lawyer. And he spent about 15 years, very highly paid, very, he was the guy you wanted to get, if you wanted to get stuff, right? Um, and what he was saying is he watched how, how debilitating it was. And he said, you know, he used this example, and I thought it was wonderful. Here was this couple. She was from Means. He was a musician, so was less well-to-do. They had, they had a couple kids. They decided it was time for them to part ways. And so they sat down. They figured it out. She said, I've got the Means. It would be wonderful if I buy you a place so that you can be near the kids. We can work this all out and whatever. Right? Cool. We're good. They go to the lawyer's. <laughs> and there was no incentive for the lawyers to have them work that out and so before it was all through they were not only in a major financial battle they were in a custody battle as well 
And so he said, I looked at that. That was the thing that said there's got to be a better way. And so this idea they call collaborative divorce. And the collaborative divorce is you have a lawyer, I have a lawyer. We work this out together in the room, how we're going to settle this. If my lawyer or your lawyer says we're going to court, they have to relinquish the case and give it to a different lawyer. Thereby eliminating all incentive to do anything but get it worked out. And I thought, wow, what a brilliant concept. Because that adversarial, if you ever notice when you get adversarial with someone, they tend to do the same thing. They don't say, oh, you're right. Why didn't I think of that? Of course. Here's my money. Take it, please. <laughs> what goes around comes around. So when we put adversarial relationship out in the world, it comes back to us. So it's just thinking about this idea of what if we, in that state of gratitude that there's always enough, that we're always sufficient, that we live in an infinite and loving universe, how can we be collaborative together even in our disagreement, even in our resolving, even in our endings, as well as our beginnings? So to me, it's so fascinating, having gone through a recent separation and ending a relationship, that people are like, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, it's like, hey, it was life. But we made a commitment that we would be as conscious leaving the relationship as we were going into it. To me, that seems logical. <laughs> that seems natural. That seems normal. And so we were able to leave in love, just making different choices. I guess not everybody does that. <laughs> but it's a possibility. You see, I think... When we are in the state of gratitude, when we are in the state of grace, when we are in the state of knowing that spirit is all that there is, we can be grateful for all things. The Bible says to us, in all things, give thanks. Guess what's the instrumental part of that sentence? Thank you. I, I gave you a little em extra emphasis so you could get that one right. Um, right? And I know, I... I would bet my bottom dollar on this that some of you, every one of us, has something right now in our lives that we are in what I call the state of pre-gratitude. <laughs> right? Not grateful yet. <laughs> in fact, maybe a little not happy about this at all. But you know, when we get it, when we get it, that everything that's happening in our lives is happening for our growth and unfoldment. The things that seem so traumatic at, some, at the point in our lives actually end up being the blessing. We, we experienced a little financial crisis in our spiritual community. We got to a point, some of you may have experienced this in your own life, where we had more, more month than money. <laughs> some of us who are attached to their paychecks got a little freaked out by that. Don't know why, just not disciplined yet, right? But you know, I love, I come back to this all the time, the Chinese symbol for crisis is change and opportunity. And so every time crisis shows up in our life, it really is saying something must change and there's an opportunity. So if we can move through the pre-gratitude quickly... And just say, okay, what is the opportunity? So we've sat down, we've figured it out, we said, great, we're going to do some things, we put it out to the community, we're getting beyond it, we're not beyond it yet, but we're well on our way. And we're creating a CSL Thrive Fund, and we're doing some wonderful things so that we can move beyond. But it also gave us an opportunity to really look at our systems, and how we're structured, and how we're doing what we do, to say, does this support the church we want to be, the community we want to be, what we are feeling called to do. And it was like, no, some things must change. You see, all of us, wisdom says to us, there's a still small voice. Listen while it's still and small. <laughs> oh, no. I don't like that answer, so I'll just wait till the big, bad voice comes along and smacks me upside the head, and I have a crisis, and then I'm like, oh, maybe I should do what the still small voice told me to do. 
right? How many times have you experienced that where you wait, you kind of have a sense, you know there's coming, but it's like, oh, I don't want to deal with that. Well, here it is. No avoiding it. Can't get around it. So we move through our pre-gratitude to a state of gratitude and say, okay, good. What must I learn? How must I grow? Who must I become to have this greater experience of life? When we start to understand deeply that life is not happening to us, but life is unfolding through us, then there's nothing against us. Nothing for us either, <laughs> just so you know. It's just life being life, wanting its highest self-expression. And to the degree that we can to awaken to that and allow that to be expressed is the degree that we experience the greater good in our life. To the degree that we limit that is the degree that we experience limitation in our life. Now, I know it's helpful to get mad at God. Why would she do this to me, you're saying? What did I do? And you move through that to say, okay, it's here. It's in my life for a reason. How must I grow? Who must I become to reveal my greater essence? So there is a wonderful sense and a wonderful knowing that we are enough, that our lives are enough. It doesn't prohibit a greater good from being revealed. But life is enough. I was reminded of a, of a wonderful little story, and I want to share that in closing today. And it's a story about a, an older woman saying goodbye to her daughter at the airport. Her daughter was leaving, and the older woman was going back home, and of course, she was in tears, but she was pretty deeply upset. The woman that was sitting next to her said, you know, is there anything I can do to help? And she said, well, I know that this is the last time we'll see each other in our physical dimension. I'm old. I'm not well. We don't have the money to travel back and forth. I know this is the last goodbye. So it's deeply touching to allow that to happen. And the woman said, I, I understand that, and, you know, I'm just here. But she said, I'm so intrigued by those last words. And she said, because the older woman had said to the daughter, I wish you enough. And the woman said, that comes from an old tradition in our family. It's a wish that was handed down from other generations. My parents used to say it to everyone. She paused for a moment and looked as if trying to remember in detail, and she smiled even more. When we said, I wish you enough, we were wanting the other person to have a life filled with just enough good things to sustain them. Then toward me, she shared the following, reciting it from memory. I wish you enough sun to keep your attitude bright. I wish you enough rain to appreciate the sun more. I wish you enough happiness to keep your spirit alive. I wish you enough pain so that the smallest joys in life appear much bigger. I wish you enough gain to satisfy your wanting. I wish you enough loss to appreciate all that you possess. I wish you enough hellos to get you through the final goodbye. She began to cry and walk away. So they say it takes a minute to to find a special person, an empower hour to appreciate them, a day to love them, and an entire life to forget them. You see, I wish for you enough. I wish for you enough of this life that you experience the fullness of it, the love, the joy, the happiness, the moments when it works. And I also wish for you the moments when it doesn't work so that you can figure out who you really are so that you can go deeper into your soul's journey, so that you can figure out that you are not this human being that occasionally has a spiritual experience, but that you are a spiritual human being allowing life to unfold through you at all times. Let us pray. As we simply turn inward, as we honor and acknowledge that one life, that divine presence, that infinite being. It is the one life that has created everything that exists out of itself. 
this divine intelligence, whether we call it spirit or God or the 10,000 other names, it is the source and the substance of all that exists. It is pouring itself in and through and as all of creation. It is the breath that we breathe and the intelligence that causes the breath to breathe. It is the wisdom and intelligence that beats the heart. It is the intelligence that caused the entire universe to be in motion, in expansion. Causing the rains to fall, flowers to grow, and all of life to reveal itself. This one life is my life. And therefore, I know that even as I speak this word, it is this divine presence spoken through me. For in it, I live, move, and have my being. Remembering this fundamental truth, it becomes very easy to speak the word of truth for each of us gathered here. As I recognize that inherent spiritual essence, that which is created in the image and likeness of the divine, which is to say that is created, in wholeness, in love, in joy, in harmony, in peace, in abundance. It is this that I recognize as the truth of who we are. And so I call that forth knowing that wholeness reveals itself as health, as well-being. I know that love reveals itself by transforming and healing and transcending our relationships. That freely we forgive and freely we are forgiven. The joy is the resonant operating force in our life. I know that we are abundant beings right here and right now, for we are one with the source and the substance of all that is. And so we allow our lives to flow. Joyously we give and graciously we receive of the grace of the divine. How magnificent it is to know that as we stand in the awareness of this spiritual truth and reality as we open our hearts and our minds to the greater possibility as we give great thanks for all of the blessings in our lives we are creating a larger vessel through which the divine can make itself known so we do indeed give thanks for the many blessings in our lives we give thanks for the blessing of this spiritual community where we come together to remember the truth of who we are where we come together to love and support and honor each other. I am grateful, so very grateful. We extend a blessing to our brothers and sisters around the planet this day. We're simply holding that high vision for a planet at peace, for a world that indeed becomes more collaborative to bring forth the best that is within all of us. So we're sensing, feeling, knowing a planet at peace, a world that works for all, breakthroughs of all kinds, that our divine inheritance is revealed into the world. And because we believe that there are many pathways to the divine, we honor them all. We celebrate all forms of worship. We celebrate all ministers, priests, rabbis, whatever name. We know that wherever two or more are gathered in the name of the I am, the I am is there. We name that good. How grateful I am. How grateful I am for this spiritual inner awareness. And how very grateful I am for a law of mind that operates upon the consciousness that we've established here. Bringing forth the highest good for all concerned in perfect time and in divine right order. So it is with joy and gratitude that I simply give thanks for these blessings and so many more. I give thanks that God is and all is well. And so I release this word knowing that it is so as together we say, and so it is.